Hi, this is Rob Woods, and welcome to episode 96 of the Fundraising Bright Spots podcast. This is the show for anyone who works in fundraising and who wants ideas and maybe a little dose of inspiration to help you raise more money and really enjoy your job. And if you work for a small charity or social enterprise, or indeed if you're thinking of setting up a charity, or you just like hearing examples of resourceful fundraising, I hope you're going to really enjoy this episode. Today, I'm going to share the first of two conversations with an experienced fundraiser named Kieran Biggins. In the earlier part of Kieran's career, he worked as a corporate fundraiser for several well-known charities before he decided to do something different. He set up a social enterprise called MindFood. In case you've not heard of it, MindFood helps people improve their well-being and mental health through opportunities to grow food and access various courses and other resources. A decade on, this brilliant small organisation continues to go from strength to strength. In our conversation, Kieran shares a bit about why he set it up before going on to share various techniques from his fundraising background that MindFood has used to generate funds. This includes a simple trick for finding potential funders interested in the kind of work that you do, ideas for working with your network, and an apprentice-style volunteering challenge which sometimes quadrupled one source of income. I find that conversations with Kieran always give me a refreshed enthusiasm for what is possible, and this time was no different. I hope you enjoy our conversation too. Kieran Biggins, how are you? I'm very well, Rob. How are you doing? I'm really well, thank you. End of a long week, but uh, feeling good today. And honestly, really excited to do this conversation. You and I know each other pretty well. We've worked together on and off for quite a long time. And I've really enjoyed hearing over the years about this journey you've been on with Mind Food, this organisation you set up years ago. And all along, I've found those little conversations inspiring uh, and I have a feeling our listeners will too. It's a different, slightly different kind of content today because initially Mind Food, I think, was a social enterprise rather than a charity. That's right. But yeah. still, I think our listeners are going to get some interesting techniques and examples and stories uh, of, of ways of fundraising that have really paid off for your small organisation. But not for the first time, I'm getting ahead of myself. In terms of setting this up, um, you now work for yourself, I think, as a, a consultant helping more nature focus charities. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, uh, I worked for Mind Food for, for 10 years and, and stepped away from it uh, about two months ago. Um, although I say stepped away, away from it, I was honoured to be asked to be a, a patron of the, the charity. So I'm still connected in, in that capacity. Um, but now, yeah, I'm, I'm working for a range of different nature-based organisations, um, currently working for Friends of the Earth uh, on their 10 times screener programme. Fantastic. Maybe let's just get into it. Uh, years ago, you and I were both working at the UK children's charity, the NSPCC, and you were a corporate fundraiser there. And I learned some interesting things from you even right back then about this slightly more entrepreneurial, more creative braver approach I always saw that you had to your fundraising and to winning new business and then also some account management but if you could uh, I mean we could do a whole episode on the setting up of a small charity or a social enterprise I think we haven't got time today but if first of all really top line question what is the difference between a social enterprise and a charity in layman's terms yeah, so I think there's a lot of confusion around social enterprise and charity. I think at, at its simplest, a social enterprise is an organisation that has a trading element with a social purpose. Um, so the classic example is the big issue where, you know, um, homeless people sell a magazine and uh, that magazine then helps uh, the homeless person with, a, with an income. Um, so it's bringing a commercial trading element to a social cause. That's good enough for me. And then let, let's get to it. There you were. You'd already been a successful fundraiser for NSPCC. Like I mentioned, I think you worked for Teenage Cancer Trust at one point. I think you worked for Scope at one point. Uh, but I don't know if it was a decade ago, but there was a point at which you just got this, this uh, 
this itch to try doing something slightly different. Could you start the story there and tell us about this journey you've been on with Mind Food? Sure. So I think the original sort of direction of, of wanting to get into social enterprise started quite early on. When I left university, I left with a marketing degree and went in working for, you know, fast moving consumer goods companies like Johnson & Johnson and kind of quickly realised that I wanted to do something with, with social purpose and came across social enterprise when I was doing that kind of research and thought, ah, this, this sounds awesome, you know, the combination of business and social purpose. But I didn't quite know how to, to get into it. And then I sort of stumbled across corporate partnerships and interviewed for, for a couple of different charities and, and got offered the job at NSPCC, um, which is obviously where, where we met. And yeah, and so kind of focused in on corporate partnerships at the NSPCC. It was a, an amazing university, really, of, of fundraising um, and uh, fantastic training which was led by yourself, Rob. But at the back of my mind, I always had that desire to either set up or or be involved in the social enterprise. And I guess then I started to get more involved in community projects. So there was a a local project where I live in Acton, um, which was kind of like a tea and talk project on on a market stall where every Saturday, if people wanted to come and have a chat and a cup of tea, they, they could. And I guess what I was hearing from lots of people was that A, people were struggling with their mental health, but B, that there didn't seem to be many outlets or places that people could go to connect with others to to do something that was productive. And I guess that kind of planted the seed in my mind of like, what, what could be a solution to this? And then I started to think about food growing and horticulture and spending time in nature and went and visited a bunch of projects that were kind of doing stuff in this space. I also went on a program called Be The Change, um, which was uh, based in Tuscany, which is a a beautiful place to go um, with people from all around the world who all wanted to create change in their local community. And it was really on that week that the idea for Mind Food was, was born. The name was born there, I started to think about the business model and came back from, from that course just being super fired up to try and turn this into reality. And then, yeah, it was, it was a journey of, I guess, testing different ways of doing it. So kind of set out initially, we were based on a farm out in Amersham. And the idea was that we would support people living in London, struggling with their mental health, to get out of London, spend time in an area of outstanding natural beauty, work on a productive farm and get involved in everything from planting seeds to harvesting it um, to then actually selling the produce on a market stall. And that whole restorative process of people planting something, seeing it grow, but then crucially seeing other people value what they'd they'd grown. Yeah, it it was very powerful. And we've since, you know, moved away from that model and I can talk a little bit more about that if that would be helpful. But yeah, that that was kind of the the journey, I guess, of of founding it and and birthing it. Yeah, and we'll put it in the show notes, but just uh, in case I forget, before we get into the fundraising techniques, if people are interested in the amazing work that Mind Food do and they want to find out more, really top line, where do they go? How do they find it? Yeah, so the website is www.mindfood.org.uk and we're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Mindfood underscore CIO, I think, is the is the handle for most of them. I guess um, just, just to... Uh, just wrap up in terms of what we're, we're, we're currently doing. So after two years of being based in Amersham, we decided the model wasn't quite right. And we uh, decided to move to Ealing, which is where most of the participants who were coming to Mind Foods lived. And we did that because we wanted to make, make it easier for people to access. Um, but also we wanted to flip the model slightly. So and this is why we kind of moved from being a social enterprise to a charity. There was a little bit of tension in terms of, 
I guess, trying to provide a therapeutic environment for people with having lots of veg box customers to uh, serve with targets to hit with, uh, you know, selling produce on, on the market still. And it didn't feel quite right. So we decided that we wanted to instead run courses um, where the emphasis was on spending time in nature, learning psychoeducational tools like mindfulness and five ways to well-being, um, and actually growing the food to, to eat and to uh, encourage healthier eating, you know, sharing kind of recipes and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and, and that's really the way Mind Food's been working for the last eight years or so. And I'm super proud that, you know, we, we know that since coming to Mind Foods, uh, 80% of participants feel calmer, uh, 90% feel less isolated, 100% are feeling physically fitter, 70% uh, are sleeping better, um, and nearly 90% are feeling happier as well. So that's, uh, I guess, the evidence for, for what we do and, and how it works. Yeah. Huge congratulations to you, Kieran. And everyone else on the team who's made it happen, I saw some just amazing examples and stories on uh, the, the film on YouTube and some, some really great quotes and stories on the website as well there, which really give uh, the human depth to those really impressive measurement things you just mentioned there. So really well done. Thank goodness it exists. And think, thank goodness you had that entrepreneurial urge 12 15 years ago to make it exist at all and now it's still flourishing even without you there at the front line driving it in terms of moving on now i mean some of our listeners might well want to just get in touch with you because they've got their own entrepreneurial idea that there's something it might be different to mind foods space but they've got their idea they've always had and and um your example of making it happen might just inspire them maybe they'll they'll get in touch with you or just listening to this will cause them to do some more research and, and maybe take that next step. But for the rest of this show, and hopefully maybe a, another show as well, I'd love to move on to some of the interesting things you've done with your fundraising skill that have helped it thrive and grow. Because obviously you've had to do many things with mind food, many other skills, but uh, without the money, it's ever so hard to do the other stuff. So you brought a particular skill set, and I think you've got some interesting examples of how you made some of the ideas that you'd learned in you know, working for larger charities, you've adapted them and made them work in the smaller one. Just before I get onto some of those, if you just had one tip for someone who has got a small charity they're looking after or a small social enterprise, there's one fundamental idea that I'm, maybe it's obvious to some, but you didn't necessarily know it before you started. What would that thing be? Yeah, so I think a really good tip that I learned fairly early on is to look at your competitors' charity accounts um, and to look at who funds them. So, for example, when I was looking at setting up Mind Foods, I looked at a couple of charities that were doing similar work, so Growing Well in Cumbria and Sydenham Gardens, and just kind of looked through their accounts and, and looked at, you know, what trusts and foundations were, were funding them. And that then gave me the confidence that, you know, if this trust and foundation's funding similar work, they might be more likely to, to be interested in funding Mind Foods and found some, some real nuggets there. So I think that's a, a sort of really quick win uh, that, that your listeners could potentially do. I love that. And just to be clear, of course, those things are publicly available, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's on the uh, Charity Commission website. Um, if you're a charity, um, trickier for social enterprises because they don't have to um, declare who, who their funders are. But yeah, for charities, it's public uh, available information. Excellent. And then key thing as a corporate fundraiser and a major donor or trust fundraiser is about networks. I wonder, maybe you did it, had to do it differently in the context of a very small organisation, but I wonder what you applied from that fundamental principle of thinking about who do you already know 
and developing relationships with them and asking for their help in who they might know that could help? Yeah, it's really interesting. So prior to setting up Mind Food, all of my experience had been working in corporate partnerships for, for big charities like the NSPCC and, and Teenage Cancer Trust. And so I sort of set about setting up this um, organization. I was like, well, these big brands aren't going to be interested in a startup uh, charity or, or social enterprise. So, and I didn't really think that I knew an, anybody within my networks who, you know, was a, a major donor or um, was connected to a charitable trust. But it's, it's amazing that when, when you start to, you know, if you're really passionate about something, and you start speaking to people about it, doors will start to open. And also, you know, think about possible connections within your network that could lead to something. So a good example was a, a friend of mine worked um, in the music industry, and I'd seen that the Amy Winehouse uh, Foundation um, were looking at projects to fund young people and I remember her speaking before that they were a promoter of Amy Winehouse. So I wondered if there might be some connection there, if I could get an introduction through my friend to the Amy Winehouse Foundation. And she was very kind enough to, to make an introduction. We had a really good chat with the Amy Winehouse Foundation and together we sort of co-created this young people program to support people, young people to... Um, who are living in London to, to come and spend time with Mind Food um, to support their mental health recovery. Um, some young people who were struggling with addictions, etc. And yeah, they they funded us. We got a six k grant, which for a, a startup charity is a, a significant amount of money. And we even had Mitch, uh, Amy Winehouse's dad, come out and visit the project, meet some of the young people. So yeah, that, I guess that's an example of where you know, within your networks, think about friends, contacts who might know somebody who might know somebody, it's always worth worth that ask. And then I guess a couple of other examples. So I was on a course. And I think during the lunch break, I was chatting to the course leader about what I was thinking about with Mind Food. And uh, he was like, oh, you really should speak to this lady called Sue. I think she'd be really interested in, in the project Mind Food. So I went and met with Sue and um, she sat on a charitable trust and really got the kind of vision and what we were trying to achieve with Mind Food. And she said, you know, put, put a funding application in um, and I can't guarantee anything, but, you know, um, it's, it's worth a shot. And, you know, that, that charitable trust has ended up funding Mind Food for the last seven years. So... Again, it wasn't something, you know, in, in, when I was speaking to that uh, course leader, I wasn't thinking, ah, oh, how can I, you know, it wasn't a fundraising ask. It was just, uh, I guess, getting your your vision, getting your projects out there and, and doors will start to open. Yes, and it really is consistent with a key thing that we teach on our Major Gifts Mastery Programme, our Corporate Partnerships Mastery Programme of, when struggling or if you're not careful you, you you want to jump to the end game of i need some money i need a corporate partner and just occasionally you fluke it but almost always that's the wrong question to ask the better to a question to ask is what could i do today that gets me two millimeters closer to a relationship with the kind of person who could bring that partnership and you know following on from that who could i have coffee with i mean you know in a, a more you know, remote world, maybe it's a Zoom call, but each month, how many conversations can I have when I get to talk to the right kinds of people who are willing to talk to me and I can listen to them and they, they might be willing to listen to me and my enthusiastic vision. Conversations or coffees, or I would sometimes call them test drives per month, is a much better thing to focus your energy on than where can I get the 10,000 or where can I get the partner? Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's more authentic as well. If you've got a vision for something, if you've got a passion for a project, if you, you know, have those natural conversations, test drives that you're talking about, it will open doors naturally in a way that if you, if I had set out to, to go on that course and said, right, through this course, I want to, you know, get an introduction to this trust, it, it just wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been natural, it wouldn't have been authentic. 
Hi, it's Rob, and I wanted to jump in really quickly to let you know about our two flagship courses designed to help you grow high value fundraising results. That's the Major Gifts Mastery Program and the Corporate Partnerships Mastery Program. Rather than have me describe it, I thought it'd be most interesting if you could hear from someone who's experienced one of these courses. So here is Rihanna Jarvis from Sustrans, who took part in the Corporate Mastery Program last year. I did the Corporate Mastery Programme in April till September last year and it was great. It taught me some awesome techniques about how to negotiate existing partnerships and win new ones. And specifically, it really helped me bring on board a brand new partner from Cold to sponsor a project that we've been doing for years for the first time, which was fantastic. They have been really supportive and they've given us 30 grand to deliver that work, which is really exciting. And I definitely wouldn't have gone about it the way that I did if I wasn't following the techniques that are on the mastery programme. So if you've got the time and you can find the budget, I highly recommend you doing it. The next programmes will begin in the autumn of 2022. If you'd like to find out more about either the Major Gifts Mastery Programme or the Corporate Mastery Programme, go to brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. For now though, let's get back to my interview with Kieran as he goes on to explain one of the fundraising tactics that has proved especially effective at MindFood. So I think one of the things I was most pleased with was we adapted something that worked really well when I was working at Scope and, and applied it for a small local charity. So when I worked in corporate partnerships at Scope, we developed this idea of a, an apprentice challenge where corporates would um, take over scope shops and compete against each other to try and get the biggest uplift in sales and, and tapping into obviously the, the apprentice TV program. And when I was at Minefeed, I was thinking, ah, is there sort of a different adaptation we could do on this? And thought about the idea of having a very similar event, but we run it on the market store where we were selling our produce. So we created the Mind Food Market Store Apprentice Challenge. And yeah, we, through that, we were able to work with brands that would never work with um, a small organisation like, like us. So we worked with a, a massive marketing agency called Dentsu. Um, we worked with Danone, Westfield, BBC, the Wellcome Trust, all because it was a, a great product that tapped into a need that corporates have to, to have, you know, these team building days um, that have a social purpose. And I think what, what was really great about it from MindFood's perspective is that it, it kind of ticked three boxes for us. So firstly, we had loads of produce that we needed to sell. And so we had this injection of, you know, 30 people probably on a day working across two market stalls selling that produce. I mean, we got through so much produce that we actually had to buy in additional produce for them to sell. So, yeah, so it was amazing in terms of uh, the revenues it would bring in. And typically on a mind food market stall, when we were running just with our, our participants, we might on a good day sell to £250 worth of produce. When we had these apprentice challenges, it was quadruple that you know regularly corporates would sell over a grand's worth of produce in a day so that was amazing the second thing was because they brought so much energy and enthusiasm and entrepreneurialism they really raised our awareness in, in the local area so you know people passing by even if they didn't buy produce would know about mind food would know about what we did and there's a lovely i guess story in terms of on one of the apprentice challenge days our now chair was walking past uh, and uh, one of the, the the teams kind of got chatting to him and were talking to them about mind food and what we did and through that interaction he then inquired about getting involved and he's chaired mind food for the last six years so and also we had lots of participants get in touch with us and say you know I heard about you through through the Apprentice Challenge. So, so not only did it raise a lot of money, but it, um, yeah, raised our awareness. And then I guess the third thing is it sort of brokered new relationships for us. So the other element we introduced was we would introduce 
competition amongst the corporates as well. So we'd say, you know, Dentsu raised one and a half thousand pounds. Can you beat that? So then Westfield are trying to do their best to out compete Dentsu. And so they would go off and do all sorts of entrepreneurial things. Like I remember one team went down to the local Santander branch in Acton, spoke to the uh, branch manager and managed to secure a £500 donation from Iron Foods. Um, another team did a raffle. Uh, so Westfield um, tapped into all the different stores at Westfield and um, got a number of different prizes that they then sold on the market store. And another organisation set up a crowdfunding campaign in advance of them coming onto the stall. So it just created this huge amount of momentum and energy with big brands that for a small charity, we, you know, we'd never be their charity of the year. We'd never be their strategic partner, but we could offer them this interesting product or event. And it, yeah, it, it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? I can totally see how that would work, that uh, even if I was initially not quite warmed up for the first five minutes, by the time my team members were out there having a laugh and ch- chatting to people and enjoying this completely different t- kind of work when they're doing their IT consultancy or whatever, I could totally see how you would, A, enjoy that day, but also it just would make you more vested in this good cause because you, you're be- becoming part of Mind Food. So I totally see how before, during and after, you're more likely to go out and do things that help this excellent cause that have now chimed with some of your values. And in that respect, it's really similar to some of the other tactics we've shared on this podcast about experiential fundraising. I remember one of the early episodes, maybe episode 18 or 19 with Di Gornel, and she was talking about the amazing many benefits of organising their sleep out event for corporate supporters, which is quite a lot of effort and time and energy to organize. But once someone has spent one night out in the cold with a sleeping bag and not getting much sleep and et cetera, the discomfort of that, but also the camaraderie of that and hearing the stories to do with young people who are homeless. Like if you've been on one of those sleep outs, you just are more likely to be considerably closer to the cause after and to go the extra mile to help them in some extra way than if you haven't. And so, you know, of course, not all of our listeners can do a direct equivalent of your kind of apprentice style challenge, but the more they can think creatively and bravely about ways they can involve existing or potential supporters in a way that is more experiential, more close to the good that's being done, the effort does tend to pay you back, doesn't it, in terms of that deeper connection? Yes, absolutely. And, and that's a really good point. So on some of the Apprentice Challenge days that we did, we, we had participants working side by side with uh, the corporates and, you know, through them sharing their experience of, of Mind Foods, that then inspires them to want to go and fundraise. So your point about the experiential, like how can you get your corporates or organisations that you work with to see touch feel what your organization is all about um because as you say then that will catapult into them wanting to be more involved and you know nipping off to the local santander branch to (laughs) to persuade the the local branch manager to to support your charity this is such interesting useful advice kieran but i am realizing the time goodness me Uh, This episode is already longer than I expected it to be. Kieran, I know there's some more interesting things that you've got to share that you've done with Mind Food. I would love to invite you back for another conversation very soon. So uh, would that be okay? I'd love to, Rob. Yeah, that'd be great. Great. Uh, Thank you so much. And uh, just in terms of today, already several really interesting ideas and tactics. So thank you for coming along to share these ones and I look forward to catching up with you very soon thanks Rob well I hope you enjoyed hearing Kieran's ideas and examples if so and you've not yet subscribed please do click the subscribe button today so that you don't miss out on all the other episodes we've got coming up including the follow-up episode with Kieran in which he shares several more tactics that worked really well for his small charity 
If you'd like a full transcript and a summary of the episode, go to the podcast section of our website, which is brightspotfundraising.co.uk. If you'd like to find out more about our flagship courses, the Corporate Mastery Programme or the Major Gifts Mastery Programme, then do check out the information about this blend of masterclasses, individual coaching and other resources on our website at brightspotfundraising.co.uk forward slash services. And if you enjoyed today's episode, then I'd be incredibly grateful if you would take a moment to share it on with your colleagues or on social media so that we can help as many people as possible with these ideas. Thank you for your help. We would love to hear what you think about this episode. Kieran and I are both on LinkedIn and you can find me on Twitter at at Woods underscore Rob. Lastly, thank you for listening today. Best of luck with your fundraising and I look forward to sharing more bright spot ideas and examples with you very soon.